today is what a difference authority makes. Authority makes a world of difference. It makes a world of difference. And I'm going to share with you from Luke chapter 4. It records the very first public sermon uh, that Jesus ever gave. And it wasn't a very long sermon. In fact, it took him probably less than 30 seconds. I know you wish I was as fast as Jesus, but I'm not. He qu- we're praying. yeah. We're, we're believing with you, Pastor. Oh, aren't you funny. He quoted the book of Isaiah in two verses. And then all of a sudden, he just sat down. But the result of the message of Christ sent an entire city in an uproar. It put the whole city, uh, it shook it to its core. And it caused chaos and pandemonium because he read two verses in the synagogue. And there are some important things that I want to share with you in Luke chapter 4 that I think that we can apply to our lives. I want to encourage you from the Word of God this morning. If you'll look with me to Luke chapter 4 verse 31 through 32. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And there they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. They were astonished by the teachings that he was preaching. In Matthew 7, the Bible says in verse 28 and 29, And so it was when Jesus had ended these things, saying, The people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes, not as the Pharisees, not as the Sadducees the teachers of the law. It says they were astonished at His teaching because His teaching was different. It had authority in His words. Not like the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the teachers of the law. It was totally different. Now I want to tell you something. If you get pulled over, and you get pulled over today after you leave church, I want you to understand the red and blue flashing light, they are not a suggestion, they are a command. Say amen. And the reason it's a command is because they carry weight. It's a sign of authority. You may not like what it represents. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. You may not be very happy about it. But if you get pulled over, you're no longer the master of your own domain. But the future of your insurance hangs in the balance. Your rates will skyrocket. And your rates will be subject to the hands of the officer. So you better be nice. They have the authority to write you a ticket. They've got the authority to impound your vehicle. They've got the authority to ruin your day. Do you know that in New Mexico it was illegal for you to have red and blue flashing lights on your vehicle unless you're a member of law enforcement? Because it represents a position of authority that is dangerous unless you actually have it. So when that officer walks to your window, shows you his badge, and asks for your license, registration, and insurance, it is not a suggestion, it is not an idea, it is not a piece of advice, it is a command. Because that individual has been endued with authority by the virtue of law. And they're acting as an ambassador of the state. Now, I didn't say Gestapo. I said ambassador of the state. Some of you will get that when you get home. Here's the problem. We've got a lot of pastors that make suggestions and recommendations. We've got a lot of Christians offering good advice and ideas. We've got leaders wanting to give life lessons and counsel. We've got believers who have become uh, convinced that there is a big devil and a little bitty God. But I want you to know, I want you to know it's quite the opposite in the name of Jesus. We have a great big God and a little bitty devil. At the end of the day, at the end of time, when we see the one whose head has been crushed by Jesus Christ Himself, And he will wonder why, we will wonder why we ever spent a day being scared of a pathetic little itty bitty worm like the devil is. When you have authority, you have no fear of the devil. When you have authority and power and the anointing, the devil means nothing to you. When you have your authority, your authority leaves you 
uh, then you just become a voice. If your authority leaves you, you just become a voice. When you have no authority, then you just become an echo. We're not echoes in this world. We are voices for the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're not echoes of this culture. We are voices to this culture. We are not echoes to media. We're not echoes to politics. We have a voice and we have a voice that carries authority. Do you have authority? You do by virtue of what Christ has done in your life and in your behalf. In fact, the Bible says that He's endued you with power from upon high. You have an open invitation from heaven to cooperate with God in the redemption of your city, in the redemption of your country, in the redemption of this world. We have an invitation because we have the authority to affect lives all around the world. Luke 10, verse 19, the Bible says, Behold, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you or harm you. Matthew 28, 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came, spoke to them, saying, All authority, all authority, say that with me, All authority has been given to you under heaven. Mark chapter 6, verse 7, the Bible tells us, and he called the twelve to himself. He said, come up here, disciples. I want to talk to you. I want to have a powwow. I want to have a meeting. And he began to send them out two by two, and he gave them power and authority over unclean spirits. Matthew 10, verse 1, and when he called the twelve disciples to him, he gave them the power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. I want you to know, as a believer in Jesus, as a believer in Christ, you have authority. You've got a God-given right to possess that authority. Now, Matthew 10, verse 1, when He called the twelve disciples together, He gave them power over unclean spirits, cast them out, heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Matthew 10, verse 1, it was prior to the cross. Matthew 10, verse 1, it was prior to the resurrection. Matthew 10, verse 1, it was prior to the Great Commission. Now, get this if you would. If we had the type of authority prior to the cross as the disciples did, how much more authority after the cross, after the resurrection, after the commission, how much more authority do we have as children of God? As children of God, we've got authority. And it's so important because Scripture isn't just to inspire us. This Bible's not to just inspire us and stimulate us and arouse us. It actually has authority to direct your life. This is supposed to be uh, where you yield it, where you wield it, where you put it in your hands and you use it because it has authority. It's going to direct your life. The Word of God will direct your life. It'll put you on track. It'll show you the right way. It'll point us in the right direction. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, All Scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, useful for rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness, so that the servant of God thoroughly, so the servant of God is thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to take the Word of God and it's profitable to convince men of the truth. See, there's a a movement today. There's a movement in our world to divorce the Word of God from its authority. Oh, it's just a book. It's just a a bunch of words. It's a mass of words. And the world wants to strip the Word of God's authority. But I'm here today to say in the name of Jesus, you stand on the Word of God because it gives you authority to see things change in your life. The world wants to strip authority away. It wants to separate authority. It wants to disconnect from the authority. It wants to split it up, break it apart. Some people like to say, well, the Word is just uh, opinions of Paul. Or they'll say, oh, it's just the reflections of John. Or maybe it's just the ideas of Luke. They don't really carry any weight. It's not really going to correct my life. The Word of God's not really going to change my life. And what people are saying is, I disagree with what the text says. What people are saying in churches even, even in the churches, 
They're saying, I disagree what the Word says. I have a better idea. I've got a better clue. I've got a better view. I've got a better concept than what the Word of God says. I have a theory what it really means. I want you to understand, your suspicions doesn't trump the Word of God. Don't add anything to this book and do not take away anything from this book. You and I are not the sovereign source of authority. That might surprise some of you. We are not the sovereign source of authority. You and I are not. The Word of God is the sovereign source of authority. And Him alone. I'm not just sharing my opinions this morning to just to stand up here and waste my time. I'm here to come and impart authority in your life so when the devil comes after you, so when you've got problems in your life where you've got things going on in your home and you have no answers, I want you to pick up the Word of God because it will change everything that you're going through in the name of Jesus. I'm here to tell you what the text says. I'm here to tell you what the Word says. John Olstein, you remember Joel's father, he would stand up and say, This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I receive the Word of God. My mind is open. My heart is ready. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. And he would confess that every Sunday morning before church. You are what this book says you are. You can have what this book says you can have. You can have authority. You've just got to pick it up and use it. You have what the book says you have. You have authority to pull down strongholds in your life. Strongholds in your children. Strongholds in your sons and your daughters. Strongholds in your spouse. You have authority to pull those down. And Jesus gives you that authority. You've got the authority to heal the sick. You've got the authority to drive out demons. You've got the authority to live a righteous and holy and godly life. You've got the authority to produce wealth. You've got the authority to raise your children as, as unto the Lord. You've got the authority to dominate. You've got the authority to rule. You've got the authority to reign. God did not leave you without. He gave you authority. He gave you something that is very, very, very special. And the church has discarded it and said, it's not my job. You have the authority to see things change in your life. And you see, the enemy is working overtime to convince you that you don't need to ask for power and authority that God has. The question is not, do you have authority? The question is, you have authority, but what are you doing with it? What are you doing with what you've already got? Sad enough to say, most churches are poorly prepared to possess or walk in the authority God has given us. When we walk in the streets of our city, we're not walking as beggars or drifters or panhandlers. We are not walking as insecure Christians or fearful believers. We are marching into the city like we own the place because we do in the Spirit. We do in the Spirit. I pulled up to the lumber yard the other day in the middle of the week, 7.30 on the dot. There wasn't a car in the place. And I just had to run in by the register and grab something and go out just that fast. And you know what it's like when you're in a hurry and you're not really paying attention and you pull into a parking place and you're not even close to the lines that you're supposed to be in. Matter of fact, you're almost diagonal where you're supposed to be. A friend got out of his car and said, Who do you think you are? You think you own the place. And I said, In fact, I'm pretty sure I do. I spent as much money here in the last 20 years. My name should be on the title deed by now. <laughs> the devil tries to convince you that you don't have power and you don't have authority but if you are a believer in Jesus, you've got power and you've got anointing and you've got authority. Somebody say amen. amen. It's your inheritance. It's your right. The devil tries to tell you you're just a renter. The devil tries to tell you you're just a squatter. I have good news for you. You are the owner of the title deed of authority. The title deed of health. You are the owner and the title deed of prosperity is yours. Power is yours. Authority is yours. Anointing is yours. Signs is yours. Wonders is yours. Miracles is yours. You're not a hireling in the house. You're not just a little slave. 
You're much more. The Bible says that you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And when we begin to act in accordance with the Word of God and with the identity that God has already declared when He created us, that we'll begin to walk in courage. We'll begin to walk in boldness. And our lives are going to carry out a mission for the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible says that people are stunned here in the Bible in Luke chapter 4. People were literally stunned that Jesus spoke with such authority. These people attended synagogue every week, year after year. But when Jesus spoke, they were stunned. They were shocked. They were blown away, astonished, amazed, and surprised. You see, I think these people got used to great speeches. All those years... They had heard all the great speeches. All those years they had heard the great lectures. All those years they heard the great orators. All those years they heard the homilies and the discourses. But all that time they were filled with empty words. Empty words were just going in one ear and out the other ear. Words full, uh, full, completely void of authority. Words that were completely void of power and anointing. The folks in the synagogue had gotten used to a boring message. They had gotten used to a boring message given by a dead, dry, boring preacher. I told the Lord, if I'm ever dead, dry, and boring, take me out, let me go home. Because I don't want to be dead, dry, and boring. I want to share with you something about power. I want to share with you something about the anointing. I want to share something about the, uh, the uh, power that you have and the authority that you get from Jesus Christ. Here they were interested in just the old words. You know, you can preach the same text and you can sing the same songs, but until you got authority, they're just empty. They're just void. They're just wind blowing through your ears. The Lord's Prayer is not, God, if you're too busy. The Lord's Prayer is not, if my life isn't too difficult, Lord. The Lord's Prayer isn't, maybe your kingdom can show up and help me sometime. No, the Bible says, it's your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you think there's going to be sickness in heaven? No. There's not going to be disease in heaven or infirmities in heaven or disorders in heaven or affliction in heaven. That's not the way heaven is. The greatest danger in the church today is not secular culture. It's, it's dead preachers. That's what it is. It's preaching dead sermons and having dead people in the service. When you actually believe the Word of God, when you actually believe this book, this book is true. And what God has actually given me is mine to use. He gave us authority to use. Then it creates a boldness. Then it creates a courageousness inside of you. Where you become not a, no longer a perpetual victimhood, but you come in perpetual victory. I'm ready for the house of God. I'm ready for the people of God to have perpetual victory. Day after day, week after week, year after year. Does anybody want it today? <laughs> Romans chapter 3 verse 4, the Bible tells us, Let God be true and every man a liar. This is truth. He wants to give you power and authority. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, greater, greater is He, greater is He. Say, greater is He. Greater is He that is in me than he that's in this world. The word authority has gotten a bad rap. We don't like authority in our world, amen? You know what I mean? You've got teachers, professors, you've got bankers and lawyers, and you've got this person and that person, you've got that husband, you've got that wife. Authority... Not mentioning names. Authority has gotten a bad rap. But authority is very good when it's used correctly. Authority is powerful when it's used correctly. Because it's been so abused and misused and exploited, that is the enemy's tactic. He wants you to think that, no, you don't want anything to do with authority. Because you see, the devil has altered it. And he's twisted it. But God gives you and I authority and the devil has distorted it, altered it, and twisted it so much that instead of our authority be redeeming, he gave us the authority, but we run from it. Authority is not, hey, I'm always right. Authority is not, I'm always in charge. Authority is not, well, we got to do it my way. Authority is the recognition of a God-given mandate to exercise influence in our world. I don't have special authority because of my title. In fact, positional authority, they say, is the lowest form of leadership. 
when you have God's authority, you don't have to announce it to people. They just take notice that something's different about you. Authority is not a bad word. Authority is not a bad thing. And we've got to have believers. We've got to have Christians walking in the authority. I heard about a preacher who went into full-time ministry, but before he did that, he was going around and dabbling in politics, and he worked for campaigns, and he'd go across the region and across the states, and he would go and knock doors. And he was telling people about the different politics of the day. He was walking neighborhoods and knocking on the doors, getting people registered to vote, handing out political surveys. And here's what he found out. There's nothing more annoying on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock than a Jehovah Witness at your door. Somebody say amen. Nothing is as annoying as that unless it's somebody asking you political questions at 10 o'clock in the morning and you're in your robe. But it prepared him for ministry. Because he had already been cussed out in every language known to man. It prepared him as he was knocking doors. He had more doors slammed in his face than he could count. But he never forgot this one day. He went to this door, knocking on the door, working on behalf of a candidate. And he knocked on this guy's door Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, woke him up out of a dead sleep. And the man came to the door all disheveled. And he was trying to ask him questions trying to be just as nice as possible. But the man that came to the door wasn't having anything to do with it. And he was getting prepared to leave and going on to the next door because the man was not receptive at all. And he saw this dog. He saw this dog, and it wasn't one of the little cute lap dogs that jump in your lap and licks you. It was a dog that looked like a crossbreed between a dog and a bear. You know what I'm talking about. And it was a big dog, a mean-looking dog. And as he turned to go to the next door, the dog bolted out of the door, chasing him, and the guy was running for his life. Throwing his clipboard in his hand, out in the air and throwing his pins in the air, trying to do everything to avoid being eaten alive. And the owner's just standing in the doorway watching what's going on. And he's watching him run laps around the yard, screaming for his life. And he used all the right words. You know those words. Quit, stop, don't, down, bad dog. He used every word in the dictionary and some I can't repeat. Just to keep the dog from eating, his, eating him for his lunch. It was interesting. After about 60 seconds of this circus that he was in, the owner on the front porch said, stop! And the dog came screeching to a stop. The reason why it's significant is because the master had the authority. The master gave the command, and that's what the dog would obey. He said the right word, but he didn't have the same authority as the owner of the dog. He had the same tactic, but he didn't have the same authority. He didn't have the same position. He didn't have the same authority. He tried the same verbiage, but it didn't work. He didn't have the same relationship to the dog as the owner did. It didn't matter what he said because he didn't have the authority to change the circumstance. When believers begin to understand the authority that they have from heaven, when believers start to understand the authority that they have and that what God gives them, God gives them authority so they have a voice. So they have a voice for this world and the world to come. Authority changes everything. Authority changes everything in the natural and also authority changes everything here on this earth. It changes circumstances. It changes situations. Authority changes conditions. It, ch it changes the state of affairs of things. Authority th changes things for the better. I'm telling you, the Master has given you authority. But so many times we abandon our authority. We leave it at the door. We don't take it. We just leave it here for next week. No, you take the authority God has given to you and you make a difference in your life and in your world. God's given you authority. God's given you authority. That's why Jesus is telling His disciples in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The same way that I was sent, He said, I'm sending you with authority. 
He is sending you with authority. Here's the thing about authority. You don't have it until you find yourself under it. You don't have authority until you find yourself under the authority. That's one reason it's so important for you to be in the house of God. That's important for you to be in God's house in the church because the canopy of this church, the canopy of this house helps embolden the voice in your house. It'll make a difference in your house. Luke chapter 4, verse 31 through 34. And then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them in the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with, his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Leave us alone! What have I to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Now, I want you to understand, this demon came out. He didn't come in the street. He didn't come in the club. He didn't come at the White House. This man came in the synagogue, in the church. And he had an unclean spirit. And Jesus wasn't looking for trouble, but trouble always found him. Amen? How many of you feel like that sometimes? You're not looking for trouble, he just finds you. The fact that Jesus had operational, uh, operated in great authority automatically put the prince of the air at a disadvantage. Here Jesus was acting in his great authority and the devil was put at a disadvantage just like that. The devil was already outgunned from the get-go because Jesus had authority. Let me tell you how to get over one on the enemy, the devil himself, is get the authority and you will put the devil on the run. You'll do that. You'll put the devil at a disadvantage. The principalities and the powers in that room and that synagogue didn't have the ability to share space with the Spirit of God. God has the highest name. God has the highest power. And that created a conflict for the devil. I'm not a demon hunter. I want you to understand that. I don't believe there are de- demons hiding under every rock or under, around every corner. However, I am convinced, I am convinced one thing, that the unseen world is much more at work in our world than we could ever imagine. How long had this demon inflicted his will upon this one man in the synagogue? Maybe it was week after week. Maybe it was year after year. Maybe it was decade after decade. Somebody should have had some authority. Somebody should have had some of the anointing. Somebody should have had the power of God. But praise God, somebody with a great authority showed up that day and the man was delivered from that day on. I wonder how many times the people had sat there in that church service and that man was there. He was afflicted day after day. And I wonder about in our churches today. I wonder in our churches today. Some people come morning after morning after Sunday morning after Sunday morning after Sunday morning all across the world and they're waiting for somebody who actually believes what this word says. Somebody who really has the power. Somebody who really has the anointing. And they're waiting on somebody with power and anointing and authority to change their circumstance if they're in. When we pray at the altar, you know we have prayer time sometimes during the middle of the service, sometimes at the very end. When we pray, we believe the Word of God carries authority to change people's lives. You see, I don't have you come up here just to look good. I don't have you coming up here to do that. I have authority and the power that God has given me. And we've got people here with power and authority that God has given you. And so we surround you with prayer to see your lives changed. God's in the business of changing lives. That's the reason we show up every Sunday. That's the reason we're here. The devil's outgunned. And he's at a disadvantage when people have power and authority. We pray at these altars and we believe in God carries the authority to change people's lives. People come in with sickness. I believe they're going to be healed. People come in with issues. I believe they're going to be dealt with. People come in with problems. I know that God can take care of those problems and they just need a real supernatural touch of God and they come up broken, twisted and hurting and they leave out of here healed, whole and well. I've had people say, Pastor, I've gone to some other churches and I went forward for prayer. All they could tell me was three reasons why it's probably not going to happen. But when you come here, when you come here, we believe that God is going to do something in your life. I don't know why healing doesn't come for everybody immediately when we pray for it, but I'm convinced of this. 
That's not my job. My job is to pray. And His job is to show up and answer. So even when I don't understand when somebody doesn't receive their healing immediately, they don't get immediate deliverance, they don't get immediate salvation, that doesn't change. I'm still going to be obedient to this book. And I'm still going to walk in authority. I'm still going to walk in power. I'm still going to walk in the anointing. And that's what God wants for you in your life. This word doesn't change. I'm convinced that this man sat in the synagogue week after week and heard the same teachers. Same teachers of the law quoting the same Torah week after week. But when Jesus showed up, when Jesus showed up on the scene, it created such a disturbance in the spiritual force that this man began to respond and the devil began to act out. I want you to know, the devil always wants to act out when Jesus is on the scene. I want this church and this all to be a safe place for people who are afflicted. A safe people, a place for people that are tormented and suffering and troubled and hurting. That's what this altar is for. This altar is here to see people's lives change. My desire is to see God's, is God's desire to see people step into freedom. But we're not here to entertain demons. We're not here to coddle demons and devils. We're not here to put up with their nonsense. We are here to cast out devils and demons in the name of Jesus. And we're here to say, you cannot belong to Christ and belong to the enemy at the same time. Oil and water doesn't mix. I believe Christians can be oppressed by demons. But I don't believe Christians can be possessed by demons. What do I mean by demon oppression? I believe the devil works overtime with heaviness. A spirit of heaviness on his people. I believe the devil works overtime with a spirit of infirmity. They're sick after days and days and weeks and weeks. I believe the devil works a spirit of oppression with a spirit of confusion. People are just confused. But the good news is Jesus Christ offers an alternative to the spirit of oppression. You see, instead of oppression, Jesus says, I want to give you joy. Instead of oppression, He says, I want to give you healing. Instead of oppression, He says, I want to give you wisdom. I want to give you knowledge. I want to give you revelation. I want you to be aware that the enemy is working, but I have an expert. But I want to be, I, I'm aware that the enemy is working, but I want to be an expert on the way the Father works. I want to be an expert on the way the Father works, and I want to focus on Him. I want to focus on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's interesting, the word that used to, uh, by Luke was to describe this man. It said it wasn't just a regular demon. He was an unclean demon. This man was created in God's image. And the demon had absolutely no right to be in that man. It's sad how many church people would rather get involved that don't want to get involved. They want to ignore people like that. We're supposed to take authority that God gave you and I to see people freed in the name of Jesus. The word unclean, the word unclean is a Greek word and it means wrong mixture. It's the opposite word of pure. And this man had a spirit with the wrong mixture that completely controlled him. A little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it controlled him. It had the idea of just to mix a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of New Age. Mix a little bit of universalism, mix a little bit of Eastern religion. Mix a little bit of uh, astrology and a little bit of your spirit animal. Just a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of theology. Somehow we think we covered everything and we covered all of our bases. Certainly, we're more open-minded than those narrow-minded Christians at Grace Fellowship Church, I can hear people say. When we were kids, we'd go to McDonald's and they just started having the soft drinks out and you could go get your own soft drink. And so you go to McDonald's and you get your fountain drink and you, when we were kids, we would take every soft drink and we would mix every one of those drinks to gather. You know what they called it? Suicide. Some people called it a graveyard. The Yankees did up north. They called it a graveyard. But that's exactly what you get when you mix everything together. You end up with a doctrine of demons. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Everything was great before Jesus spoke. Everything was in place. Everything was just fine. Everything was hunky-dory. There was no problems. And then all of a sudden when Jesus shows up, there's a crazy man on the scene and he's got a demon in him. An unclean demon. And demons always speak up when there's a higher authority that's released. 
Now watch, everybody was smiling with Jesus. But when he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. He said, I'm the only one. He said, I'm the great teacher. He said, I'm the great philosopher. They didn't mind that. He talked about love and he talked about traveling all through Jerusalem and Israel with Birkenstock shoes and and drinking herbal teas. Everybody was okay with Jesus then. But when he began to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the place went crazy. Do you remember when Peter said, you are the son of the living God? He told that to Jesus. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon that rock, I'll build my church. Jesus is not one of many answers. He is the answer. He's not one of many gods. He is the God. He's not one book in your library shelf. He is the Word. It's a narrow door. And we've all got to pass through that door in order to have eternal life. Going to India when I went with Solomon. Going to India, I was informed that you don't say God is the only God because, boy, it will really tick some people off. But how many of you know I'm kind of well known for that? (laughs) I'm going to tell people truth. I'm going to tell them the real truth, that there's only one God, there's only one Lord, and there's only one King. Somebody's got to tell them. We've got preachers who are too afraid to make those type of claims. But if we don't have the courage to stand up for Jesus and say He's the only way, we might as well hang it up. Jesus is not just a way. He is the way. Luke chapter 4 verse 33, the Bible said, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice. Without fail, the demon's number one job is to distract the real work that is at hand. Jesus is teaching the crowds. They're amazed. The word of God is going forth. And all of a sudden, here's a man screaming at the top of his lungs. We see the enemy at work over time. And he tries to get you distracted from the great work that is at hand. See, the enemy works overtime to get you distracted. And if you choose to give your attention to every distraction, you'll never reach the goal that God has for you this side of eternity. The distraction probably came from the back seat of the synagogue. And the devil wants you to lose your focus in the midst of distracting circumstances. It's probably the greatest act of spiritual warfare that you'll ever engage in. See, the enemy wants your focus so he can have your attention. And he wants your attention so he can have control your direction. And he wants your direction so he can dictate your destiny. We have to be refusing the enemy. We have to refuse the enemy to keep us not being distracted by his loud voice. We've got to be disciplined so we can hear the still small voice and refuse the enemy and not let the enemy have a foothold. Notice how the demon responded, let us alone, let us alone. And these demons were so upset about Jesus reading two verses from the book of Isaiah. Do you know what he was reading? Do you know what he was reading there? These two verses was this, the spirit of the living God, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to uh, to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recover sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of God's favor. I see these verses and they carry the weight of a man who intended to fulfill what the scripture said. You see, Jesus was very convinced about Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 3. He was very convinced And when Jesus uttered this phrase, it sent shockwaves across the congregation. And the demon just couldn't hold back any longer. When you make a confession of faith, when you get baptized, when you get saved, when you begin to serve, when you begin to give, when you begin to worship, when you begin to shout, when you begin to pray with passion, it serves a notice on the devil in hell. We're here to proclaim the good news of the living God. We're here to see people brought into freedom. We're here to see the oppressed free. We're here to proclaim this year belongs to the Lord. I want you to know 2023 belongs to the Lord. We're here to proclaim that. It's not empty words. It's not just vain words. It's a declaration that's shaking hell. When you wake up in the morning, I want the devil to think, oh no, he's awake. She's awake. Oh no. And we're not going to stop declaring until the pearly gates swing open wide. See, that's why worship is important. You know, when Leah's up here with the team, worship is really crucial. 
Because you're singing the Scriptures. You're singing about the character of God. You're singing about God's nature. You're singing about the heart of God. You're releasing a declaration when you sing into the atmosphere that the Bible says will not return void. And Somebody said, well, I already sang that song at church. I'm sure you did, but the unseen atmosphere needs to hear you sing it. I'm sure you heard the sermon before, but I want you to understand the unseen atmosphere needs to hear you say it again. God wants you and I to be disciplined. God develops the ongoing work of sanctification by repetition. You know in heaven they're basically singing two songs all day long. Two songs are singing. In Revelation 4.8 is one of them. The four living creatures having six wings were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. Then they were singing Revelation 4 verse 11. The Bible says, You're worthy, O Lord. You're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things. But your will, they exist and they were created. You know, in, the, in heaven, there's not going to be 10,000 songs. There's going to be two. We might learn the words after a while there in heaven. Amen? When the church gathers, faith rises up. And the church makes the declaration that when God wages war against hell, things change. You know, when we had the COVID shutdown, the world was going crazy. Cities were literally turned upside down and churches were closing. You know, they say now a thousand churches a year close in America. We were never so vital, never so important as any other time in history for the church to remain open. That's the reason we remained open. Because when believers gather with the intention of glorifying Jesus, it sends shockwaves through hell. Shockwaves. Watch the demons. They were afraid that Jesus was out there to destroy them. Here in Luke chapter 4, which we know will happen, the demons and devil will be destroyed at the end of time. But it tells me you and I, you and I can take power, you and I can take the authority, and we can put the devil on the run, and the devil's going to lose his grip. There's no need for the devil to win. There's no need for the devil to have authority over your life. I believe chains are going to start breaking. I believe when that happens, it makes the devil very nervous when the church refuses to quit. The Bible said Jesus rebuked the devil, the demon. Be quiet and come out of him. And the demon had thrown him in the midst and he came out of him and it didn't hurt him. And they were all amazed. They spoke with themselves saying, What a word this is! For authority and power He commands the unclean spirit. And they come out. And the report about Jesus went out and spread all over the surrounding region. Jesus rebuked the demon. And the demon had to come out. Why? Because Jesus had authority. I want you to know Jesus gave you authority. He just didn't give you a key to get into heaven. He gave you authority to change your world. He gave you authority to change your life. He gave you the authority to change your home and your situation. Jesus said, come out, and that's exactly what happened. What a word this was. And Jesus just quoted two verses. When you begin to quote the Word of God, it'll change your life. It'll literally change your life. And Jesus sat down after he quoted two verses. He wasn't doing an 18-part series, folks. He wasn't filling it up with a, a great flowery, cool sermon illustrations. He didn't just release a best-selling book. He just read two verses. He quoted them. And the response of the crowd was they were totally blown away. It wasn't a two-hour sermon. He had authority. And authority always comes in such a way that when people hear it, the fire of faith blazes in their heart. Revelation comes to their mind. Transformation comes in their lives. What a word this is for the church. When you get a hold of the word authority, it's going to change your life. It's going to change how you pray. It's going to change how you work. It's going to change how you serve. It's going to change your whole life. This man here in Luke chapter 4, his life was changed. Never again, never again, never again did demons come into his life again because Jesus cast them out. Faith is crucial that you take your faith 
and apply it to the authority of God's word. It's so important for you to grasp authority. It's so crucial for the church to grasp authority. I'm believing for fresh authority to come on you today that you'll see signs and wonders and miracles. The world is crying out for a demonstration of God's sovereign power and we carry it. But most of the church doesn't carry the authority. We owe it to our region. We owe it to eastern New Mexico. We owe it to New Mexico. We owe it to this nation. We owe it to our world to take the authority that we have and use it for the glory of God. You see, we don't serve a weak, anemic, emaciated God who's frail and feeble. Jesus says, take the authority in Him. I'm giving it to you. God's calling us to a higher standard this morning. He's calling us to a higher standard so you don't live below the level of your invitation from God. I don't need to pray for more authority because He's already given it to us. He's given us the authority to transform people's lives. And we hold the treasure in earthen vessels. And the city is crying out, help us. Help us! People of Grace Fellowship Church, help us! And in Jesus' mighty name, we have the authority to help those in need. Would you take authority? Would you take authority today and say, Lord, I want the authority that you've given the church. And I want to possess it now. So I can see people's destinies unlocked. So I can see healing coming to people's lives. So I can see demons cast out. So I can see resources flow. God is at work. He's at work this morning. He's at work this morning and He wants you to take the authority that is yours. If you are a believer, if you are a child of God, if you are a son and daughter of God, He wants you to take the authority that is rightfully yours. As the team comes, would you just take your hands and just put them out just like this? God, I pray right now for people to possess the authority to see their lives changed. We need not need to be continued to living in turmoil and strife and hurt and pain. We don't need to be living like that because you've given us authority. Lord, take, let us take the authority that is in our hands right now. Let us take that authority and begin to use it in our lives. Let's be difference makers. Let's take the authority of the Word of God and let it come alive in us so we can see people changed, lives changed. God, I pray that we would live the book of Luke, chapter 4, the chapter there in verse 4, where we would see the devils and demons on the run. And we'd see the power of God show up. Lord, show up today. Show up in your people. Show up in this house. Show out in this place. We have the authority. We take authority now. Take authority now. I give that to you now in the name of Jesus. I give you authority now in the name of Jesus. It's all yours. It's yours. It's yours. It came with salvation. It came with knowing Jesus. Authority is yours. Take it. Take it so you can see lives changed. God, do it now. God, do it now, today, in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. If you're here today and you need a miracle in your life, I'm telling you it's coming your way now. It's coming your way today. And I want to lay hands on you and I'll pray for you. So if that's you, you step out. You'd be the very first one to come. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm just weak and undone. I don't know what to do. I want to pray for you that you have authority authority over the enemy authority over the devil so in a second or two we're going to stand you come you be the very first one as we stand now would you come come quickly pastor so whenever he was talking about Christians being possessed or oppressed I was one of those about eight years ago I had let I praise and worship team and I was doing everything I thought that I was supposed to be doing 
but I let the enemy get in my mind and tell me you're not good enough. You're not her mama. You're not who, who God says you are. And I just let him keep beating me up until he finally just had a hold of me. And there's a whole long story that is incredible. But the way I got out of it, whenever pastor talks about the authority, yes. the authority of my husband, he came and he said, in the name of Jesus, you will Amen. not take my wife. Amen. In Jesus' name. Because he took authority over me as Amen. my husband. Amen. Amen. So if you are going through something like this, Amen. come up here and let us take authority Amen. for Amen. you so you can take authority Amen. over your life. Because after that, Amen. I have authority. I don't listen to that anymore. Take authority over your children. You have authority over that. Don't stand and let the devil keep beating you up day after day after day Amen. after day. Amen. Don't take that anymore. I don't take it any longer. And if you can't do it, go to your yes. somebody that you trust, Amen. somebody that has authority. Say, Amen. please pray for me because I can't Amen. get out from under this. Amen. And let them have the authority Amen. to cast them out Amen. for you. receives the authority, the authority, Father God, that comes from the throne room, authority that comes from heaven. And Lord, I pray for Dalton today that you would move in his life. I pray that you'd move in his home and move in his family. God, I ask that you move right now. Begin to shift things in his life. Begin to shift things in his family's life. What they're going through, the predicaments they're in. God, I take authority over them now in Jesus' name. And I say in Jesus' name, Lord, come alive in his family. God, I speak life into them healing, health, wholeness. God, I pray that you would touch my good friend. Touch his family today. God, do only what you can do. Do only what you can do now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. Touch my friend. Heal him today in Jesus' mighty name. God, I pray for my good friend today. I ask that you touch her. Lord, I come against any infirmity in that eye in the name of Jesus. The doctors have said there's going to be issues and problems for this for months and years. But I say in Jesus' name, I take authority over that eye. And I say in the name of Jesus, that eye is made whole. The doctors are going to be astounded. The doctors are going to be blown away. The doctors are going to say, I don't know what you came here for. You are well in Jesus' name. I take authority that we have from the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I apply my faith with Luella today. And I speak over her eyes and say in Jesus' name, be well. In Jesus' name, be well. In Jesus' name, be well. Can I pray for you? Do you need prayer? Come on. dental surgery and we're going to pray for you that it goes well no problems no issues you're going to be made well in Jesus name Father now Father now I pray for Avery today I pray you would touch her I pray that you administer to her now I pray for health wholeness and healing upon her today I pray that she will recover from the surgery quicker than doctors anticipated she'll be made well we take authority over any issue because it's our God-given right. We're children of the Most High God. And we're not afraid. We're not fearful. We're not shy or intimidated or backing away. We're pressing forward in the name of Jesus. Health and wholeness and healing. Now, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. What do you think? Amen. Take authority. Right? You need that, don't you? You do. It's time. It's time. Take authority over your life. Take authority over it. In the name of Jesus, I pray now, as she says, I need to take authority of my life. My life has been a train wreck. My life has been a mess. In Jesus' mighty name, I 
pray that she receives authority from the Most High God today and she will take that authority to go after the enemy, to go after the devil who wants to destroy her, to take her out. We will not let that happen in the name of Jesus. We take authority. We take authority. No longer, devil, are you going to have free reign. No longer are you going to do what you want to do. No longer. We're tired of that. God, we want the authority of Jesus living in our lives where we're never the same. Never the same. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. We bless you. We bless you today. We bless you. That spirit of oppression, of heaviness. I say now in Jesus' name, we take authority over that. And we say in the stead of oppression, of heaviness, there's going to be great joy on Cindy. There's going to be a great joy. Grieving may come for a day. Sorrow may come for a day. But it has to go now in Jesus' name. We take authority over all oppression of the enemy. Never again. Never again. Spirit of joy. A spirit of hope, a spirit of peace, happiness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Get into a, a spirit of praise. Just give Him praise today. Give Him praise today. That spirit of oppression has to leave. That spirit has to go. In Jesus' mighty name. Cindy, Father, I, I believe that Cindy receives a spirit of joy, hope, happiness. Come on her now. Devil, you wanted to take her out. You wanted to defeat her. You wanted her to be miserable from now on. You wanted to be hopeless from now on. In the name of Jesus, we take authority now. Well, in Jesus' name. Has hope for the first time in a long time. Joy for the first time in a long time. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Yes, yes. Wow. Amen. Amen. Take that. Take that. Take that spirit of joy. Take that spirit of joy in Jesus' name. Take that oil of gladness. Hallelujah. Devil's defeated. Devil has no place, no authority. Devil, you're on the run. You're out of here. We take authority in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Can I pray for you? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on quickly. Come quickly. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you. You may be seated.